Hey everybody, welcome back to this series on preparing Curse of Strahd for Shadow Dark. Uh, in this video, I'm going to be going through Ravenloft, and the Ravenloft encounters, both random encounters and the actual encounters in the book, and just talk about how I might change them, um, both as written, so just like what I might substitute in, um, if I was going to run Ravenloft as written, and then how I might change it to fit more what I'm going for. So, first, let me go through the Ravenloft encounters, which this is just the random encounter table. So, the way that Ravenloft random encounters work are, every time you enter an unoccupied room, or you spend 10 minutes resting, uh, you roll a d20, and on an 18 through a 20, you have a random encounter. And then for the random encounter, you roll a d12 plus a d8, so it's a curved, uh, it's a bell curve. Um, you're very unlikely to get 2 or 20, you're very likely to get like 11, 12. Um, 10, 11, 12, in there. And these are the random encounters. Uh, on the left here, you have Esmeralda on a 2, Rahadan on a 3, Black Cat, uh, Room of Animated Attack, d4 plus 1 Flying Swords, you have a Blinsky Toy, Unseen Servant, D4 Barovian Commoners, 2D6 Crawling Claws, D6 Shadows, D6 Swarms of Bats, Strahd Zombie, Crawling Around, D4 Plus 1 Vistani Thugs, D4 Whites, a Trinket, Giant Spider Cocoon, Barovian Witch, D4 Plus 1 Vampire Spawn, and finally, the man himself, Strahd Von Zarevich. So, this is the random encounter um, table as it works in the book. So, how would I change it uh, if I needed to change it? And actually, so I went through this whole dungeon. And I went through every encounter and every random encounter and just looked at how you'd have to change things. And I was really surprised by how little work you actually have to do. There's a few things, stat blocks, you'll have to invent, but it's fairly easy to do so. Uh, take a few uh, stat blocks that are already in the book and just change them very slightly. So Esmeralda, you don't need to change that encounter at all. I have my problems with that encounter, but leaving it aside as an encounter, it's fine. It's just an NPC who can join you. As long as you've statted out Esmeralda, um, it's great. So don't need to change that one at all. Rahadan, you also need to stat him out. I would recommend using a mage stat block. The mage stat block is pretty good, but it's not impossibly strong. You can see here it's AC 11, HP 27, um, with one spell plus five to cast. Um, arcane armor, can target himself and raises AC to 16 for 2d4 rounds. I'd probably have him already have cast that when he enters into the fight. So he's got an AC of 16 as opposed to 11. Makes him a lot harder. Then he's got Blast, Cancel, so if they do manage to get a powerful spell off on him, he can, he can end that effect. He's got Levitate to stay out of their melee range, and he's got Snare to take out any big uh, creatures while he gets away, or anyone that chases him down. So I would say Blast is his main go-to here. Uh, he's just going to be blasting targets for 2d6 damage each round after he levitates up into the air. And I would so I would give him maybe some way of keeping that levitate uh, alongside him. I would also keep his... Um, I would add in his, uh, uh, his, his devil companion, his shadow demon companion, along with him. Uh, and just have him follow him around the, the place. But I would change it to an invisible stalker. There isn't a shadow demon in the book, uh, but there is an invisible stalker, and... It works in the same sort of way. The Invisible Stalker has ways of grappling in particular creatures. Um, just have it, instead of pummel, give it a grapple. So it grabs them. And then that'll sort of double up with his levitate and his blast to keep him in sort of a more interesting encounter. So I would say have that Invisible Stalker along with Rahadin, although it's not going to attack unless he's attacked, right? And he's not likely to attack anyway. The, the, the random encounter in the book doesn't have Rahadin attack you. So just make him a mage and, and give him the Invisible Stalker that protects him if he's attacked by the party. But... You don't need to have him attack. He's not going to. The Black Cat, nothing to change there. Totally fine. The Broom of Animated Attack, super straightforward. Um, you can use basically any stat block in the book if you want to, um, you know, mimic it. You could use a giant bat. Um, you could use a, uh, you know, a boar and give it the flying ability and give it two attacks at plus three. Um, and if it hits you with both, it does an extra damage or give it, you know, some stat block that makes it... Uh, uh, more of a joke than any really serious threat. It's not a serious fight. It's a really easy fight. Um, it's just there kind of to be silly. So give it any weak stab block. A giant bat or a boar just change the flavor of it. Instead of a bite, it's a stab, right? Or it's, it's a bash, right? That's the only thing you really have to change there. Um, and the same thing with D4 plus one flying swords. I would just use giant bats. Uh, no, I don't mean flavor them as flying swords, right? But um, just use this giant stab, giant bat stab block and you'll be fine. That's basically the same idea there. Blinsky toy, you don't need to change anything. The Unseen Servant, you might need to change some of the damage output, say, of the poison, because uh, there's a lot of different 
things that the Unseen Servant can be carrying, and one of them is a cup with poison in it, um, which can do a lot of serious damage. One is a spell book with a lot of spells. Um, you don't want to give your players all access to all of the spells in the book, especially since Strahd himself is different. In Shadow Dark, you're going to have a different list of spells he's going to have, so it doesn't work the same way. So you're going to have to change a few of those entries, but really not too much. And it's not really about matter of balance. Reduce the poison damage. It's 44, I think, on average, which is just going to kill anybody at that level in Shadow Dark, so reduce the damage of the poison. Maybe to, you know, on average, 20 damage or something like that. Or maybe 15 damage by the time the players are here. But you don't want 44 damage. That'll kill a lot of Shadow Dark characters, straight up. Um, okay, the Barovian Commoners is a great encounter um, for a lot of reasons. Doesn't need to be changed. Crawling Claws similarly doesn't need to be changed. I would use the Spider stat block, just remove the poison so these things are doing one damage. Uh, the, the, not the Giant Spider, just the Spider stat block. Maybe you could use the Rat stat block and have these things be creepy and diseased or something. Um, maybe you could, but I, I would probably just use the spider stat block and remove the poison. So these things are just doing a little, two attacks, doing a little bit of damage, um, one damage each. There's just a swarm of them. I might increase the swarm to like 3d6, uh, but that's about it. You don't need to change that one very much. It's not a matter of over damaging. The swarm of bats is actually a little bit strong, and this is one you might want to watch out for because swarms of bats, um, they're actually fairly strong in Shadow Dark. Um, the bat swarm, it's got, uh, AC 12, 18 hit points, 3 attacks plus 2, a D6 damage each. So if you have D6 of those, say you roll 6, I mean, that's 24 levels worth of creatures. That's actually pretty challenging. And, you know, you have to have a party of about 6 to deal with that effectively. 4 level 6 characters would deal with that effectively. That's that's pretty strong. So be careful with this one, I would say. If, you, if your party gets here a little early and there's only 3 of them, or they're only level 3 or something, or 4, maybe they've just come in a little bit early, uh, maybe modulate this one a bit a bit you know if you roll a six maybe maybe make it a d3 instead of a d6 or if you roll a six maybe have them come in waves as opposed to all at once or something you know be careful with that one and the straw zombies you don't need to change anything it's just a simple kind of scary gross spooky encounter it doesn't really do much for the in terms of combat Vistani thugs also don't need to be changed very much you can use the thug stat block out of shadow dark and it works totally fine um thugs are down here um they're level one, so this is a really weak encounter. In in five e, this might be if you roll d, if you roll a four, you get five thugs. That might be a bit on the strong side. Even if you roll a d four in Shadow Dark, you're only going to get five of them, and these guys are a level one. So if your level three party is just going to wreck these guys pretty quick, they're not really a threat. So um, this one's one you might want to boost a bit, if anything, because it's a little too weak for Shadow Dark and the equivalent thereof. But if you're not worried about being too weak, you just want to have them run into Vis and Vistani. This is a fine encounter. D4 Whites, that's basically directly on par with, with 5e. I think the White stat block is about as powerful in Shadow Dark as the White stat block is in 5e, relative to the player power. So I think it actually works straight up. You don't have to change the Whites at all. Again, if they're low level and you roll a 4, that might be a bit hard if they're level 3, but Whites are, are level 3 creatures, and so... If there's only a max of four of them, they're only ever going to be an average challenge for the party, maybe even a little weaker, especially once they've leveled up a bit. So wouldn't worry about this one too, too much. Trinket, the same thing. Giant Spider Cocoon, I have my problems with this encounter. Um, I think it's really dumb, but I'm not talking about whether it's dumb or not. As an encounter, it's fine. It doesn't need to be changed. You don't need to worry about it. Um, the thing you need to watch out for with this encounter is just some of the possible random elements after you roll inside. Um, the only thing is the Barovian Lunatic, um, but that's it. The host of a swarm of giant spiders is fine. There's the Vistani Bandit. That's also okay. You just use a thug stat block or a thief stat block. There's a Strahd Zombie, which is not bad. There's a Barovian Witch, which if you use the, um, the uh, Hag's Daughter stat block that I developed, it, that would be totally fine. Um, here, Hag's Daughter. Uh, this it would be totally fine for that encounter. It's weak, but it's just, you know, it, it'll be there. So no problem at all with the giant spider cocoon. Same with the Barovian Witch. Hag's Daughter, just use that stat block and you'll be totally fine. 19 is where you start to run into some trouble. Vampire Spawn. Because Vampire Spawn are, are pretty strong, right? They're, they're challenge rating five creatures. And if you roll five, that's level 25. 
uh, means you're going to have to have a level six or seven party to deal with all five of them on average. These guys could, could really overwhelm a low level party, especially if you're level three and you happen to roll 19 and you roll a five on the random encounter, you need to be careful. This is another one you need to modulate. The, the, the vampire spawn and the swarms of bats are the only two that I think really need to be modulated based on how the party, the level of the party when they come in. you got to be careful. You don't want to overwhelm them. And then either of those encounters could overwhelm them. So be careful with either of those. And then there's Strahd von Zarevich himself, which totally depends on how you've adapted him for this campaign. Now, if, if you use the stat block I have here, then he's going to be a bit more of a... You encounter him, he talks to you, taunts you, maybe fights a little bit, but then gets out of there with fly or gaseous form or, or uh, you know, sleep. Or he just uses his shape change to turn to a bat and fly away. Especially if you give him the heart uh, in the tower, he's not going to drop anytime quick. Um... So this is a totally fine encounter as long as you don't push it. Um, because if the party's not ready for it, if they're level 3, then obviously he will wreck them, right? If they're level 3, then he, even Strahd on his own will just destroy them. Um, a couple bites and a charm, and they're gone. So this is an encounter that you want to be careful with, but I think that uh, makes sense. You know, you're not going to have Strahd be the final big bad in any random encounter room. He's going to be uh, in the final room where they find him, or, or, or down in the crypts, or something like that. So use him as more of a warning encounter, as sort of a role-play encounter, rather than a straight fight. And you don't have to change anything as long as you use, I think, the stat block that I've developed here, presented here. Okay, so random encounters as written are totally fine. But, um, basically, there's two you have to modify. Now, I'm not going to use this random encounter table. I'm not going to use this style of random encounters at all. But I just wanted to show you guys you know, straight up what you might do. I'm going to go through really quickly, and I mean really quickly, the monsters and traps in Curse of Strahd for 5e. Again, uh, sorry, the set encounters is what I mean. The set encounters uh, in the various rooms. And there are some that you need to be careful about and some that you really don't. Uh, many of them you really don't. So in K7, right at the entrance, uh, we have this, uh, let's see if I can bring it up here, right here at the entrance, right, right here in K7, we have the... Uh, dragon wormlings that only attack you if you leave. Now this encounter is dumb for a number of reasons. First of all, you're if you're leaving Ravenloft, it's because you're probably low level, right? You've gotten in here too early, and once you come in here to deal with Strahd, you're not leaving. So this encounter is balanced for a higher level party. Four dragon wormlings, red dragon wormlings in 5e are pretty strong with their breath weapons. Boom, 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 boom. You have four breath weapons right away. And if if you're leaving Ravenloft, chances are you're low level because that's why you would leave. So if these things attack you when you leave, you're just it's just super dumb. They're going to kill your party. Now, Shadow Dark doesn't have a Dragon Wormling stat block that I could find, not in the base book. So you're definitely not going to use the, the Fire Dragons in there for this fight. So I would change this into a trap, or I would change it into maybe one uh, like Fire Elemental and give them the stat block of a Fire Elemental, or maybe make it for Gargoyles or something, with, and maybe give them like a Burning Hand spell. Something like that so that it's not as deadly lethal right away. So so K7 might not even come up because if a party comes into Ravenloft, they might not leave. It only happens if they try to leave. So, you know, this one is one of the main ones to watch out for. In K8, you have eight gargoyles and they have that effect where they blow out the candles. And if the party doesn't have their own light source, this can be pretty tricky. Eight gargoyles in, in, um, in Shadow Dark are actually... You no, know, fairly strong. Go to the gargoyle stat block. Um, these are creatures that are created. Um, gargoyles. Here we go. Uh, they're level four creatures. They're only damaged by magical sources. That in and of itself is pretty tricky. They're AC 16 with 20 hit points, and they're getting two attacks at plus three. So they're they're pretty strong. Eight of these. That means that's going to be 16 attacks if they all hit. 16 d6 that's enough to kill a couple party members right so you've got to be careful with this one especially if the lights go out and they have advantage on their attacks and the players have disadvantage on their attacks until they get a light going so i might do this one in waves two gargoyles then two then two then two every round two joins that way the players can focus fire a bit and not be overwhelmed the fight might go long but you don't have to worry about them all coming down at once that's probably how i would change this and then i might make it so that if the players do have like a torch or a lantern lit that doesn't go out Right, so the candles go out, but the player's light sources don't go out. That's just what I would say. Uh, and I think the rest of this fight can be played out as, as written, especially if these characters 
are above level three or four. Now, if they're at level three, then maybe don't have the gargoyles trigger, right? Maybe they're coming into uh, Ravenloft to find somebody or to do some reconnaissance. Maybe have one of them move a bit, but then hold its position. And, and so it indicates that maybe these things are a danger, but they don't trigger, they don't attack the players. That, that would be one, one way of doing it. If they're here at higher levels, though, you can have this fight. I would just have it come in waves. Unless they're like level 8, right? <laughs> or something like that. If they're at that point, then just have all come, all of them come at once. Um, so other than that, we've got the heart in K20. Uh, the armor traps in K19. Armor traps in K19 are um, pretty minor. Just change the damage. It's a little high for Shadow Dark. Where is K19? Um, do, 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 goes right here. Yeah, K19. Uh, it's, the damage is a little high for Shadow Dark. It's like, I don't know. Um, 15 or 16 damage on average, I think. Um, that's a little bit high. Uh, let's see, K19. Oh, never mind, it's only 2d6. That's that's really light. Yeah, you can use that. That's totally fine. You don't have to change that one at all. Um, in K28, we have two Strahd Zombies. Super easy. Um, not, not that hard at all. Um, in K20, we have 10 Halberds, right? K20 as you come up to the heart. Um, awesome, yeah. So in K20, you have these... 10 halberds and four vampire spawn, which come up if the heart is attacked. That's pretty hard. 10 halberds, especially if you're using like, I mean, it depends on what stat block you use for them. If you use the giant bats, but make them do a D, uh, say a D8 damage and you lower their AC to 11, which sort of corresponds to the idea of the, the longer halberds that are easier to hit, but they are hit for you know, a bit harder with the leverage. Um, that can still be a bit overwhelming. 10 D8 damage in a turn maximum if all of them hit on average you're probably only going to have three or four hit so it's three d eight damage is still significant per round and the fact that there are ten of them means you're not going to kill them quickly um they've got nine hit points if you use the giant bat stat block so uh fireball can kill them but burning hands won't uh, magic missile won't spells won't easily kill them are you really going to risk a fireball losing your fireball on a bunch of magic halberd probably not so um this is one you got to be a little bit more careful about just in terms of maybe again in waves, have five of them come and then a couple rounds later have five more come. Now, if you throw in the four vampire spawn on top of that, then this is a very deadly encounter. Uh, ten of these followed a few rounds later by the vampire spawn. Now, it's also worth noting that they don't have to happen simultaneously, right? The, the, um, uh, the halberds can come in you can fight them, and then you get up to the heart and damage it, and then three rounds later, the vampire spawn show up. So you can, you can, they don't have to be simultaneous, but if it is simultaneous, then be a bit wary about that one. The players can get in over their heads, that's fine, but just be careful about that one. The other thing to watch out for here is the shaking of the tower. Now, um, checks, you know, are, are lower. And even though it's a DC 10, uh, in Shadow Dark, you have a lower dex save. Uh, you don't get the saving throw bonus. You don't have a lot of extra ability to to do that. And you certainly can't survive the sort of drop that you might be able to survive in 5e, um, even from a lower level. Uh, you know, 190 feet, that's probably going to kill even a lot of 5e characters. But it'll definitely kill Shadow Dark characters. So be careful about that one. Very clearly, you want to um, uh, telegraph it, make it clear that it's going to be a precarious climb. And if they're standing around and doing it, especially as they start to damage the heart and the tower starts to shake, that that's a really dangerous trap. So they have to be careful about it. I would say, you know, maybe make it very clear that they have to secure themselves. And then at that point, when they're like secured to the wall or something like that, then throw in the vampire spawn. That'll make an, inter an interesting fight. But stagger it and telegraph it. You don't want to unleash 10 halberds, saves to not fall, and four vampire spawn all at the same time to shadow dark characters. That'll kill them. So keep that one in mind. Um... Helga, the maid in K32, totally fine. Uh, vampire spawn, one vampire spawn by the time you're here. No problem at all. Um, really, at least as far as I can tell. It doesn't seem to be a problem uh, in my view. K K32 is up here. Um, let's see, is there anything else up on that area? Um, vermin swarms in K35, that's not a problem at all. Um, the cake in, in uh, where is this? cake in k36 it can release if you want it can unleash an invisible stalker that's cool i might do that um the invisible stalker is a cool villain and it's not too strong at this point so you can definitely include it although it is a hard thing it's you know three attacks at uh plus four d6 damage each that's pretty strong so i would keep an eye out 
for it, but it, especially if it gets an ambush round. But it's cool, and I like it. All right, K38, we get the Gas Sleeping Trap. Pointless, <laughs> totally pointless in my view, but whatever. It's it's not dangerous, it's not deadly. K39 does permalock, though. If you're not careful, if the players aren't careful, they can get locked in here, and if they don't find the door to K31, then they'll just think that they're trapped in K39 and K40. So just give them, you know, show them the secret door to K31 easily. Maybe don't even have it be a thing they have to find. It's just open or something like that in that shaft. If they find this, if they get in here, don't... I mean, you might trick them for a minute, but as soon as they search, don't have them roll. They just find the secret door out. Otherwise, that's stupid. If they all fail, they all roll ones, then they're just trapped in here. I mean, maybe they then try to climb out uh, through the roof, the broken roof, and, and down onto the dome of the chapel. Okay, you can make an interesting thing that way, but that's so precarious, and again, you're really risking death, so... That's up to your, your taste and the party's taste. I would just have 31 be open. Uh, 31 be the secret door to that. Um, once again, we've got giant spiders in K40. And once again, I say be very wary. There are five of them as written, which is enough again to TPK a party in one round if they all fail their con checks and all the spiders hit. Just be aware of that. If you want to run it as written, you can. It's going to be a tough fight. Maybe the spiders poison them all and hang them up and a couple of them get free in an hour or a couple hours, right? And so then they have to try to find a way to escape. It could make it an interesting encounter, but if the spiders are just like poison and keep biting them over the course of the day to keep them poisoned and we're going to eat them, then that's, what, that's what's going to happen, right? Uh, the spiders will do that, continually bite them to keep them poisoned and subdued so that then they can just eat them at their leisure. So that's just over TPK. So don't do that. Maybe make it two spiders, three spiders, and a whole bunch of, of little spiders. Make it, a, make it a swarm battle rather than just an actual five giant spiders alone. Uh, in K42, we have Gertruda. That works totally fine. K43, we got the horrifying blood creature. It's just an illusion, no creature. K45, we've got the statues of the ancestors. Again, no problem there. Uh, those, aren't, those aren't fights. Um, K46, out on the parapets and on the battlements, you have Strahd's armor, animated armor. And that's pretty cool. I actually like that fight. Um, I think it's a cool thing to have running around is this really heavy animated armor. You're going to have to use a different stat block because animated armor in Shadow Dark isn't that strong. So I might make it like a Reaver. Right? Just It's just a blackened armor riddled with cruel barbs. And it has this bloodlust attack. It's got three attacks at 1d8 plus two damage. It's a hard fight. It's a level six fight, which corresponds more to the stronger animated armor that we have in 5e out on the roof. So I would use a Reaver for that one. Um, K47 is another really cool encounter. I really like this combination of uh, Rug of Smothering and uh, Portrait, um, Guardian Portrait, because the rug keeps you locked in, and the portrait seems more like a trap than a monster, so players aren't necessarily going to think of attacking it right away. They're going to attack the rug, they're going to try to get out of the room, but the rug locks you in place, and this, this, this portrait is casting spells. So just go through and pick some spells that are sort of damaging, but not hugely damaging. You don't want to, again, use Fireball here and kill the party, but Magic Missile or Eye Bite or, um, you know, any of those lesser spells you might pick um, for the portrait to have. That'd be cool. Um, confusion or something like that. Charm Person, maybe. That'd be kind of a cool thing to have. Um, maybe the portrait charms one of the party and they don't know it. So that way when Strahd shows up there, someone's already charmed by him. You can do something like that. Uh, but it's a cool encounter. I think it's a great, uh, it's, it's nicely balanced. Um, 49, we have Escher. Again, a cool encounter. As written, it's just a simple vampire spawn one, so that's no problem there. 50 through 56, we have the chance of witches and cats. And the witches in Curse of Strahd are pretty weak. And if you use the, um, the again, the uh, stat block I've come up with, this Hag's Daughter stat block, then up to seven of them is a little challenging. That's 21 levels worth of creatures. Um... But that's not impossible, right? That's a level five party or six party could easily handle that or could handle that. Um, could get out of hand if they're not careful, if they get ambushed. But I think even if you encounter all the witches in one place at uh, and all seven of them, it's still not going to be the end of the world at level five or six. Uh, probably level six, they'll handle it very easily. Level six would be a little bit harder if you use the stat block that I've developed here for them. If you use your own, or if you, you know, that's up to you. <laughs> but this is just what I would say if you use this one for them. Uh, Piddlewick the second up in 59, no problem there. The elevator trap in 61, Cyrus Bellevue down in 61. By the time you get down here, um, in the uh, Larders of Doom, right? <laughs> Larders of Ill Omen. Then uh, the encounters are pretty straightforward. Cyrus isn't a big threat. 
You can make him any kind of NPC stat block, and if he's by himself, he's just not going to be a threat by this point. Unless you make him like an Archmage or something. That wouldn't make any sense. I'd probably make him a Thug or maybe maybe like a Gladiator or something like that if you want him to be a bit uh, more of a challenge. You find him a Berserker, maybe. Um, but I wouldn't make him an Assassin or a Cultist, not a Druid. Yeah, yeah, I'd probably use um, Gladiator or... or um, I'd probably use Gladiator or Berserker. Yeah, Gladiator or Berserker, and probably Berserker. Um, so that's Cyrus in K62. In K63, we've got Yellow Mold and the Black Pudding. Black Puddings are totally fine. Uh, no problem there. In Shadow Dark, you can use that. They're, they're strong, and they'll melt some weapons and gear, so be careful about that, but otherwise you're okay. Uh, K55, we've got the Kitchen Zombies. It's creepy, but three zombies is not hard. Uh, in K69, we've got ten Skeletons. But 10 Skeletons is not that big of a threat, and you can also turn Undead by that point and just destroy them all. <laughs> um, as you look down here, let me get to the Skeletons, you'll see that even 10 of them isn't that big of a deal. Um, you're looking at 10d6 max if they all hit, but they're plus 1 to hit. Um, or their short bow, you can give some of them short bows. They've got 11 hit points, so they're probably going to survive a hit or two. So it's a, it's, a, it's a fight that will take 3 or 4 rounds. It's, it's a draining hit points fight, it's not a deadly fight. Challenge rating 20, even with 10 of them level 20, that's four level 5 characters can easily handle that. And again, they'll be, or on average, it's an average challenge for them. I think that's okay. You're probably not going to lose a party to the 10 skeletons there, but it might drain some some resources. And then in case 72, we've got Rahadin and the Shadow Demon, which I would just, again, use, as I said, the Invisible Stalker and the Mage stat block for that. And I think that works out just fine. Um, down below in K74, we've got a Grey Ooze. Once again, no need to change the stat block there, just use that. Uh, Emil, the Werewolf, you can use a straight-up Werewolf stat blocks, and you got six zombies in K76. That one is a little bit, um, a little bit harder, but not much. Now, K78, you've got these two Iron Golems. That's just such a ridiculous room. It's so overpowered, it's so out of character with the rest of the dungeon. I would just change that entirely. Uh, two iron golems. I mean, it only happens if you trigger, if you attack the brazier, which I don't know who's going to do that. But I would just have them maybe, well, you know, the first time you attack the brazier, if for whatever reason you want to attack it, you want to destroy it because you don't want Strahd to get around so quickly or something like that, right? Because you can warp around a Barovia this way. If you want to destroy it for that reason, you figure out what it does and you don't use it and accidentally teleport yourself out there and you're like, oh, dang it, man, I'm totally trapped uh, out on the Zelenka Pass or something. Then I would um, I would use the, the breath weapons first, and then if they continue to attack it, maybe one of them animates. And then if they destroy it and they still continue to attack it, maybe then the other one animates. But I wouldn't have them both just go out, all out attack, and, and be two iron golems just fighting in the room. That uh, That's just going to kill anybody, in, in Shadow Dark at least. It's actually a tough fight in, in 5e, honestly. Uh, and then we've got Glyph of Warding, but that's just an illusion, and the trap down to the cells, which is totally fine. Then we have the crypts, and this is just where you, I don't know why you even run this, man. It's, I mean, in Shadow Dark at least, there's so many crypts here that are ridiculous and absurd. Um, bats everywhere. If you, if the players just start attacking the bats indiscriminately, they're dead. The bats, bat swarms in Shadow Dark are no joke, and there's basically an unlimited number of them if they start blasting into the ceiling. For every 10 foot square, only a, like 2d4 can form, but 2d4 bat swarms, if the players get it into their heads that they need to fight them, then that's a real big problem. So I would I would discourage that and uh, somehow make it clear that the bats are not to be toyed with, not to be messed with, and if the players start, then, well, maybe maybe they deserve to die if they do, but they will probably die if they just start blasting into the ceiling with bats. So keep an eye on that one. And then a lot of the tombs are fine. Ghouls, ghosts, gargoyles, whites, uh, banshees, the vampire spawns, spiders. Uh, there's Sir Klutz in there. There's an imp. Hellhounds. There's a wraith. There's a nightmare. There's the brides. It's it's a lot of stuff, but it's all isolated. You're not going to have to fight them all at once. If the players go crypt by crypt, they're going to be just drained by the time they get to Strahd. They're not going to do that. I mean, I wouldn't imagine. So I think you can leave it pretty much as is. Just be careful about the one with the ghouls, the illusory floor. And be careful of the teleport trap that sends you down to the room with the whites and skeletons. Now, they've changed it in 5e from the old edition, right? The whites aren't just out and about. They're all hidden in their tombs. So the player has to go around opening each tomb in that room in order to wake up each white. And then if he kills the white, then you get a bunch of skeletons. That one's not so bad. Um, if they teleport down there, then it can be tricky. But they're just teleport in, teleported into the tomb. Uh, and if they don't, they open up their own tomb and then climb out and find their way out, then that's fine. 
Um, the players will kill the ghoul that took their place, and then they'll hunt around for them. Especially if they've found it before, they'll know where they are. If they don't, then it can be an interesting little trap, like, uh-oh, I'm separated, where am I? It's a creepy moment, but... Ultimately, I think it just kind of slows things down, the way that it's written here in, in Curse of Strut. Still, you can do it, and I don't think it'll be too big of a problem. And then, even at the very end, all you've got is the three vampires spawn around uh, in K86. That's not a problem. Um, fighting all three at once isn't too hard, uh, especially for a higher level party, level five or six, by the time they get down here. Um, if they're fighting Strahd too, then that's a tough fight. But, you know, that's kind of the point. Three vampire spawn and Strahd, sure. Uh, you're going to have to be careful. They're going to have to have ways of protecting against his charm and the charms of the vampires. If they're vampire spawns, they don't have the charm. But if they're um, vampires, then that's really tough. It's a really hard fight. So I would try to not do that. Um, in Shadow Dark, my, my gut instinct is to have you fight, have them fight Strahd elsewhere in the castle, have him be reduced to zero hit points or one hit point and go back to his coffin. And you've had the big climactic fight and then you get here and other undead are trying to stop you from finishing him off. And so you have a big fight while someone's trying to pry open the coffin. Uh, creatures are attacking. It's a desperate thing, but it's not because Strahd's there too. So that's what I would say. Put a bunch of spawn, maybe add in some ghouls or vampires. Other vampire spawn, maybe have skeletons come in. Make it a big, desperate fight, but don't have Strahd be there while everyone else is fighting. Strahd should have been encountered elsewhere, defeated maybe, and then be back here to heal. That's how I would recommend running it. All right, well, that is, um, I think, how you how you need to run Curse of Strahd for Shadow Dark. Uh, and pretty much it's straight up. Like, you don't have to change all that much, as I said. The things you really need to focus on are you need to change the Wormling battle. Um, you need to change the Giant Spider battle, or needless to be aware of it. And then this big crypt, just if the players go room to room, give them an out or a way to, like, rest up somewhere. Because, again, in Shadow Dark, they don't have the same sort of longevity that you have in 5e with short rests. They have to take a full long rest. Um, and they're probably not going to be able to do that in the dungeon if you're rolling every 10 minutes of a rest for a random encounter. They're not going to be able to rest in the dungeon, which means they're going to have to leave, which means everything's going to slow down. So I would maybe either cut down the number of random encounters you have here, theoretically, um, or break a bunch of the tombs up and have them not be monsters. Keep the ones that you want but limit it rather than just having all of them open. Or if you have a party that's going to search a couple tombs and go straight for Strahd, then that's fine. Leave it all here. You don't have to change anything. But just be open to adapting it on the fly if your players start to uh, start to go crypt to crypt because then I don't think in Shadow Dark they're going to be able to maintain their power level that will be sufficient to face uh, Strahd in his tomb. All right. Well, I hope this has been interesting. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to go through... I think it'll be the next video. I'm not sure. Uh, we are we are going to play this weekend. Um, but I think I'll probably put out a video either tomorrow or on Saturday um, where I go through and uh, talk about how I'm going to run Curse of Strahd in terms of encounters and how I'm going to change the structure. This was just how you would transfer it as written from 5e to Shadow Dark. But I'm not going to run it as written. I'm changing a whole bunch of things. I'm adding in a cult that's operating out of here. Uh, I'm taking out the witches, I think. I'm going to change most of the crypt because I don't like those silly puns. I don't think it fits the tone that I'm going for, at least. Changing the random encounters that I'm going to be doing and, and how I'll approach them to make them more uh, narrative and much more, um, I think, interesting than these as presented in the book. So anyway, hope you guys look forward to that video. Hope this has been interesting, and I'll see you all then.